Mod 20 group test. Now, most groups scored very, very well on this. I think the lowest grade that I got from any group was a C. Most people got A's and B's, which is good. However, keep in mind that you're going to be on your own tomorrow, right? You don't have your group to help support you on this. So let's go ahead and start going through this. Period one. Um, so number one, like I said, it's basically a multiple choice question. Your options are population, parameter, sample, and statistic. Can any of those be used more than once in this problem? Not in this one. You're going to have one population, one sample, one parameter, and one statistic. Okay? What is the easiest thing to identify first? Population. Population, population is the biggest group listed. What is the population here? Right there. There's my population. Okay. Um, what is my sample? Can my sample be a percent? No, because my sample is the number of people that I'm interviewing or the number of items that I'm testing, whatever the circumstance is. So this is my only other option for my sample. Now I just got to figure out which is which. How do I determine parameter from statistic? What's the difference? The statistic is about the sample. S goes with S. The parameter is with the population. P goes with P. So um, for the entire group, 72% was the mean. So what does that make 72%? If it's going with the population, that's my parameter. And that makes this one my statistic. And it does say the sampling of 50 students, that's the mean of the 50 students. Okay? Easy enough? Now, for the group test, we have six parts and we have six possibilities. And on the group test, each possibility was used once. So that way, we could make sure to cover all of the different types. On the individual test, your options may be used more than once or not at all. So does that make sense? On the individual test, there will be six options. You may use all six once. You may use five and one of them twice. You may use something not at all. Okay, but on the group test, we wanted to cover them all so we could make sure to explain them all before the test. Capiche? Okay, so don't just go through and cross it out and think that you're never going to use it again. You may. So um, let's talk about these all really quick. Cluster. You break something into groups, and then what? You randomly choose a few of the groups and everyone in those groups, right? Self-selected is what? Volunteering. Volunteering. Stratified? Picking one every time. No. Stratified is breaking into groups again, but picking a few from each group as opposed to picking a few groups. Okay? Systematic. Every fifth, every tenth, every other, there's a system. Convenience. Who's closest? Who's, closest? Who's easiest to get a hold of? And simple random, that would be like drawing names from a hat, randomly picking things off a list. That's the most random. All right. So the teacher needs students to do a problem on the board. So she selects every fifth person. That right there is my key. What does that make it? You want to know how many people in your math class have their driver's license. So you ask three sophomores, three juniors, and three seniors if they have their license. This one is a little tricky. A lot of people said this was cluster. It is not cluster. It is stratified. What are my groups? Sophomores, juniors, seniors. So there's my groups. But I'm not taking all of the sophomores. I'm taking a few from each group, which makes it stratified. Okay, 
All right, you want to know how many people in your math class have their driver's license. So you ask five people who sit near you if they have their license. What is that one? Convenience. Convenience. Those are the people closest to you. By the way, should we have any spelling issues tomorrow? I hate talking about this, but the words are spelled out there for you. So I shouldn't have to wonder what you're writing, right? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge for some of you that your brains move faster than your hands as you're writing. All right, the teacher needs students to do a problem on the board. She has all the students' names in a bowl and picks four students to do the problem on the board. What's that? Simple, random. Randomly selecting numbers off a list, randomly picking names out of a hat. That's all simple random. All right, you want to know how many people in your math class have their driver's license. You create an online survey and ask the class to respond. What's that one? Self-selected. Why is that self-selected? Because they get to choose if they're going to fill out your survey, right? So that would be a self-selected one. All right, last one. Your teacher needs students to do problems on the board. She picks two groups from the te group test groups to do the problems on the board and asks all members from those groups. What's that one? Cluster. Because in here, that way, the way that works is we have eight or nine groups, right? So if I randomly choose group five and group two, I have chosen two entire groups from the groups that were created. That makes it cluster. Okay. Now again, tomorrow, you're not going to be able to use process of elimination on that last one. This one you could have, but tomorrow you won't necessarily be able to do that. Okay. So be aware. All right. Number three, if people missed points on the first page, it was likely due to number three. Now, number three, you have to take on the role of the survey writer. Okay, I cannot come up to you and ask you, how do all of your students get to school? You can't answer for everyone. You can only answer for you. So when I get a question about how students get to school each day, and people say, how do people get to school each day? That wouldn't be a question you would see on a survey. That would be a hypothesis that you're trying to find out information about, but what would a more appropriate question be for the survey? How do you get to school every day? Asking an individual, you can only answer for yourself, right? Okay. There were some, especially for the numerical data, that was, oh gosh, I wish I could get a good example right now off the top of my head. I should look through the other ones. Um, you know, how long does it take people to get to school? Well, if someone walked up to me and said, how long does it take people to get to school? I would say, I have no idea. I can only tell you how long it takes me to get to school, right? So, right up here, this was the most common question was, how do you get to school? But you have to word it as if you are talking to an individual. That's a survey question. Asking them to make a statement about a whole group isn't a survey question. That's either a hypothesis or it's a conclusion that you're looking for. Does that make sense? Okay. So, write one question you could ask if you wanted categorical data. So, you could say, how... Do you get to school? Some people could say, do you take the bus, do you drive, do you walk, or do you ride your bike to school? Giving them the actual categories they could answer. That's fine as well. But it has to be a question to an individual. If I wanted numerical data, how long does it take you to get to school? What time do you leave for school? Those would be numerical questions. But again, you can't say, how long does it take people to get to school? Because that's not a question you would write on a survey. Okay? So you would say, how long does it take you to get to school? Good way to check yourself to make sure you're writing it in the appropriate way is the word you in your question. 
If it's in your question, then you're talking to an individual, and that would be appropriate survey question. Okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. The histogram problem. Here's what I do first on my histogram. You ready? We'll see if it shows up here. I do this. Can you see what I'm writing? Barely. What am I writing? Numbers. What numbers? Here, I'll write it above so you can see it on the screen a little bit better. I'm writing how many are accounted for in each bar. That way it's easy for me to add up, right? So, how many children under 10 are in this waiting room? Well, if this is my boundary and everything above there is 10 to 14, 15 to 19, and so forth, then under 10 is just this bar. How many are in this bar? Two. Two. How many people age 15 and over? Well, this is my cutoff for 15, and everything to the right would be over 15. So 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And finally, how many people are included in this histogram? How do I find that one? Add them all up. Add them all up. 2 plus 4 is 6, plus 5 is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I don't want to be in that waiting room because that's a lot of people. Questions? That should be like the easiest points because that feels almost like third grade right there. Yeah? Okay. All right, so turn the page. All right. The data listed is the number of siblings each student in sixth period has. I think I asked my sixth period a long time ago, and now I've just kind of manipulated the data how I want it to. Make a line plot or a dot plot of the data. Make sure to label your axis. So I must see numbers under these little dash marks so that I know. Now, I have made sure, and I have gone through and checked, because I've already got your test, that there are enough lines for you to put every number you need to put. You may not be able to start necessarily at zero. For example, if your numbers go from three to eight, there's enough lines for you to number three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? Now, I'm going to look here by saying what's the smallest number on my list? Zero, because you can't have a negative number of siblings, right? This particular question wouldn't make sense. I'm going to call it zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you can just keep going if you want to, if you have more lines. Now, some of you did dots and some of you did X's. That's totally fine. I don't care which one you choose to do. Um, so let's see. Here's four, two, 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 two. That's four twos. One, two, three, four. Three, three. One, two, one, five. Three, zero, one, three, two, zero, one, six. Now, this may have been a little bit petty to you, but I did go and count your dots. There should have been two here, four there, six there, four there, and then one, one, one. Okay? So make sure your dots are accurate. Again, I don't care if you use X's or dots, just make it accurate. Um, describe the distribution of the dot plot as skewed to the left, skewed to the right, or symmetric. Well, this does not look symmetric to me because there is definitely a lower end over here. This end would be what we call the tail, right? So if the tail is on the right, what does that mean? It is skewed right. The direction of the skew is where the tail is. Okay? So far, so good? All right. The box plot shows information for two sets of data, set A and set B. A is the top one, B is the bottom one. Okay? Oftentimes, you'll see two box plots together in order to compare them. Estimate an interval for data set A that represents 75% of the data. Notice the word estimate is underlined. Some people wrote, oh, that's from the minimum to Q3. That's not an estimation. That's an exact. It is from the minimum to Q3. 
What I want you to do is estimate based on this number line, give me actual numbers. Now, 75% of the data is either a whisker and the first and the two boxes, or it's the two boxes and the last whisker, right? It has to be three sections in order to be 75. So um, we're looking at data set A. So I'm just going to kind of estimate. This looks like it's from 4 to 13. Or if you had done the other one, get a different color, you would have had from 7 to what? 16. So you could have had 7 to 16 or 4 to 13. Most people did 4 to 13 and that's fine, but either of those are correct. Does that make sense? I'm looking for actual numbers. Which data set, A or B, has the larger IQR? Well, you could find the IQR. How do you find the IQR? Q3 minus Q1. Or you could remember that what is the IQR describing? The size of the box. So in other words, this is asking which box is wider. And if I know that it's asking which box is wider, it's clear that it is B. If I wanted to do some subtracting, I could say, okay, this first one, it goes 13 and 7. So 7 to 13 has an IQR of 6. Or this one goes from 6 to 13, which means it has an IQR of 7. So that's how I would see the B is bigger there. Make sense? Good answer. All right. The last chunk of problems. Use the data set to find parts A through H. So I'm going to start off by writing these all in order. What's the smallest number on my list? Four. And then what? Five, five. And then six. And then eight, eight. Right? And then 11 and 13. Now, I always go back and double check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers on the list. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I have eight numbers listed, so that's good. I didn't forget any. Now, the easiest thing I think to pick out first is the mode. What is, what's the most popular number? There's actually two of them. Five and eight. Yes, you can use a little and symbol as long as it looks like an and symbol. Okay. Um, all right, my range, that's easy to find too, isn't it? What do I do for the range? Maximum minus minimum. What is 13 minus 4? 9. My range is 9. Can I find my median pretty easily? It'd be right here. How do I find it if there's two numbers in the middle? Add them and divide by 2. 6 plus 8 is 14. Divided by 2 is 7. So my median is 7. How do I find the mean? Add them all and divide by what? In this case, that is 8. divided by 8 is 7.5. So I have 7.5, 7, 5, and 8, 9. Now i got to look at standard deviation. Actually, before I go to standard deviation, let's do the five-number summary because I already have some values for the five-number summary, don't I? When it says label, there were some groups that put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's not a label. What are the labels that I'm looking for? Min, Min Q1. You could either put Q2 or you could put median, your choice. Q3 and then max. What do I know so far? I know the minimum is what? Four. I had to use it to find my range. I know the maximum is 13. And what else do I know? The median, which is what? Q2 is 7. Yeah? So now I just need to find the median of the left side, which would give me what? Q1. 
and of the right side, which would give me Q3. So of the left side, if I look at just those four numbers, keep in mind, if there was an odd number of numbers and I had a median that was actually on my list, I crossed it out and I don't count it when I'm looking for these. What's my median there? What does it fall between? Five and five, right? Falls right there. What happens if I add five and five and divide by two? I get five, so Q1 is five. On this side, my median falls right there between 8 and 11. So let's see, 8 plus 11 divided by 2. What is 8 plus 11? 19 divided by 2 is 9.5. Okay, I think I'm going to do standard deviation last. What's my IQR? That would be Q3 minus Q1 which is 9.5 minus 5, which leaves me with what? 4.5. And then I've got tons of lines here to be able to do my box and whisker plot. I only need to get from 4 to 13. So let's see, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and that's as far as I need to go. I didn't even, oops, that's 14. I didn't even need to go to 14, did I? All right, four. By the way, some people did their box and whisker plot on the line, which makes it very hard for me to see your whiskers. So please do it above the line. See up here, it's done above the line. Please follow the pattern. Thank you. So here's four, five, seven, nine and a half, and 13. The outer two sections are whiskers. And then in here, I do my vertical lines and connect them to be my box. All right, what's left? Standard deviation. Notice it's worth four points, so don't skip it. Because four points on the 50-point test is really like 8%. Okay? So, standard deviation. Now, I need to take every number on my list and I need to subtract the mean from it first. So, I'm going to take them in order because I happen to have them in order here. So, I'm going to do 4 minus the mean, which is 7.5. And then I'm going to square that result. And then I'm going to do 5 minus 7.5. And I'm going to square that result. And then another 5 minus 7.5. Square the result. And then a 6 minus 7.5, square the result. 8 minus 7.5, square the result. 8 minus 7.5, square the result. 11 minus 7.5, square the result. And when you have more space, try not to run it into your box plot. 13 minus 7.5 squared. Now, for each one of these, do not round off only round off at the very end. Because if you round off in the process, you end up losing some accuracy. So four minus 7.5, when I subtract that and I square the result, I get 12.25. This one gives me 6.25. This one's also 6.25, because it's the same. This one's 2.25. This one's 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 12.25 and 30.25. Now, I went through that quickly. You can do the work on your calculator. What do I do once I have those subtracted and squared? Add them all up. When you add all those up, you get 70. Last step, you need to divide it by the number of terms, which is 8 minus 1, and take the square root which is the square root of 70 divided by 7, which is the square root of 10. And when you calculate on your calculator, the square root of 10, square root of 10, I get 3.162. What does that round off to? 3.16. Yes, I take off a point if you round incorrectly. That's something that you've been practicing since like first grade. Okay, 
So at this point, you better be pretty good at that. Any questions about that? So that is the one part, the standard deviation, that's going to take you more than 30 seconds to answer. Right? All right. My work is done. Happy studying.